Okay, so remember, we're hitting 20th to 21st century. <clears throat> Rewind everything. Remember, I've covered about our current situation with globalists they've taken over, and they've used a certain religion, which is the fastest growing in the world, as a convenient advantage and opportunity to use to fulfill their globalism, to fulfill their globalist role. We've also seen from our last history class, remember, Judaism is shrinking. Christianity is also shrinking where people are leaving churches. But recall, Islam is growing. So if a particular religion is increasing so much and they're being used by globalists to fulfill their vision and then the other religions are shrinking, think about what the tribulation talked about. How much will the Antichrist with his world government be able to use this particular religion, which is increasing, to annihilate, to persecute, and even complete genocide against tribulation saints? So think about that. Think about that. Remember, these events are already being set up and played out. It's not a coincidence. And I've given you some scriptures to see which group of people, which religion would be most likely to be used by globalists during the tribulation to persecute or to decrease God's people. Was that clear enough? All right, so I can't say certain words, so you know what I mean, right? But the gist of the message should be very clear. That should be alarming. In our last history class, I proved that to you. All right, now let's rewind a bit. Let's review. How did we end up in this globalist mess? Remember, back then, we had good Christianity going on due to the King James Bible and the Great Awakening revivals. Remember that the country of America was becoming very prosperous because of that. Now America is just so broken apart by globalists because the reason why is they've forsaken their Christian roots. So revised version is important. So you attack the authority of the Word of God. So notice that Christianity is, being, is go undergoing through the revised version. And because of that, it became this kind of a culture, Catholic communism. Now, I'm not saying that the revised version made everyone Catholic communist, all right? So you Calvinists, you know, just uh, don't pee your pants and get upset at me, all right? So that's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to point out, though, is that it weakened the authority of the preaching and word of God. As a matter of fact, this is important to understand, but even during the Great Awakening revivals, the Great Awakening revival preachers through the authority of preaching the word of God, is now being weakened by endorsing the revised version. Charles Spurgeon was guilty of that. It said that he retracted what he said, uh, supporting the revised version or critiquing the King James Bible at the end of his life. So I'm not sure if that's really true or false. J. Frank Norris, there are even some quotes supposedly where he was endorsing manuscripts backing up the revised version. Now remember, J. Frank Norris is a guy who was mainly responsible for our denomination, independent fundamental Baptists, that were fighting against the modernism that was infecting Christianity at that time. So even J. Frank Norris was getting infected by that. Now other Bible believers would say that he was King James only, but either way, whether he was King James only or not, the point that I want to give to you is that this revised version was such a poison that was sapping out the strength and the authority of the Word of God. Because revival cannot come unless there's authority from the Word of God. And when the authority of the Word of God is being attacked, critiqued, then that affects the preaching. If that affects the preaching, the people cannot be convicted of their sins. And that will change the culture from a godly Christian heritage to this kind of a culture. You have to understand that. Okay? All right, I want to make sure that uh, the cameraman is 
really uh, catching the screen and what I'm doing, okay? All right. Um, the revised version is what sapped the energy. Even dispensationalism, like I told you, paved the way where it rescued a lot of this infected culture. It rescued a lot of this and kept intact some biblical roots remaining in this wicked culture. Remember, some people got upset with C.I. Schofield because they said that the nation of Israel would not have been restored had it not been the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, I don't know why they want to give that much credit to dispensationalists, but fine. If that's true, praise the Lord. That's why the Lord gave last chances to our nation, America. Because remember, God promised that if you bless the nation of Israel, he will bless you. Because of that, that's the reason why America was still saved and in its prosperity roots. Another thing is because Larkin's books were spreading all over amongst Baptist churches, he rescued the Baptist denominations that were falling into apostasy. As a matter of fact, even charismatics, and like I told you before, charismatics who are getting into prophecy are taking dispensationalism from Larkin. A lot of charismatics came from Baptist roots, like I told you before. So remember that dispensationalism is also what rescued the country. But even Larkin himself and even C.I. Schofield was getting infected by the scholars here. Because remember, the scholars were mainly the one responsible for promoting revised version uh, beliefs, revised version uh, brainwashing. So this one was infecting every major Christian leader. So they still had a KJV root. A lot of people took it for granted, the King James Bible. Preaching was based off mainly the King James Bible. But this was infecting. So it was weakening the Great Awakening Revival. So this one was weakening this. And this is coincidentally when these guys became strengthened. Because recall your history, the Illuminati, and then later on Skull and Bones, they were secret. They did have some influence even among elites or presidents and government leaders, but they didn't have that much of a strong root where it infected or they influenced the entire culture. They were in secret. But the round table, that was their success, recall. The round table, Rhodes and the round table was a huge success where they were able to have a public, now publicly, the strong influence. Strong influence publicly. And they started coincidentally when Revised Version came out, just like about two or three years later, after the Revised Version. That's what I taught you in our previous previous history classes. So don't forget that. I know I've given you a lot of information, but it's important to write some stuff down that you think are important nuggets that I said and write them down and not forget them because it's important that way you don't forget them. If I'm not reviewing, you would have forgotten, see? So I'm spending 10 minutes only reviewing because we've forgotten. So that's why it's important. So they were the one who had the public influence Coincidentally, the same time, timing when the authority of the Word of God is being attacked. So these skull and bone guys and Illuminati guys, we've seen them, some of those guys joining these globalists, which is mainly promoted to the public now by the round table. Now, obviously, they don't say, hey, I'm a globalist, I'm taking over the world. But now the public realize, the public are realizing these certain names of globalists, and they don't attack them, they don't critique them. Sometimes they tried, but they failed. These globalists had a strong influence and stronghold on the public now, and they didn't lose it. They didn't have to go into hiding, really. That's my point. So these guys didn't really have to go into hiding. The names of these globalists didn't really have to go into hiding. Just their ideologies certain controversial globalist beliefs had to be in hiding, obviously. But their goal of globalism didn't have to be a secret. It didn't have to be a secret now. Now, from this type of ideology where uh, Britannia or Britain will take over the world, 
it's now switching to uh, a one world system that's taking over the world because it just sounds very uh, white superior uh, racist. So they can't do it, do it that way anymore. So remember they transferred into what is known as CFR. And these globalist names from the round table, remember they were responsible for starting CFR. CFR is still alive today, guys. CFR is still alive today. Go to their website, and then if you go to their website of the CFR, you will see big globalist names in there. And it will kind of make you a little bit freaked out. Some of these names and globalists you heard about certain conspiracies or criticisms of what's going on, you have to realize that a lot of those names that you heard about, they're conjoined or they're connected to the CFR. That's the reason why today's so-called truthers are hitting against, it's the CFR, they're the ones that are guilty of everything. But remember this is that the origins go further than Skull and Bones Illuminati and Round Table or CFR. CFR is just so recent. That's what the truthers are concentrating. You have to go further than that. It goes back to Round Table. Further than that, it goes to Illuminati right here. But further than that, don't forget, it's those Jesuits. It's the Catholic Church. So it's those ancient, our ancient enemy from back then. That's why it produced from the globalists who had a public influence, these, this Catholic influence that used to be gone, now revived again right here. So this is our modern century now, the 20th to 21st century. Now it became a Catholic communist culture today. I strongly believe, like I told you before, that all of us, all of us unconsciously have a Catholic communist uh, bias or culture or mentality or influence. I strongly believe that. That was proven in our previous history classes. In our previous history classes, summary is this. One is the globalist agenda and goals that influence the public. We see Catholic ideologies matching up with that or their roots or their involvement. That was proven. The sec and I'm not going to review through all of that, okay? No, I'm not, all right? Just take my word for it. Just pay attention to my previous history classes, okay? All right. The second thing is that through Avro Manhattan's work, who did a very good job, and then other historians, the, the Catholic culture and the communist culture are the ones who pervasively try to bring in their ideologies into the whole world. Remember that. So it was, that's why World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, and today, and through our secret agencies today, and through our politics today, you see Catholic and communists fighting each other or conjoining together, or basically bringing their influence upon the whole world. That's the bottom gist now. Even Yuval Noah Harari in his book, I think it says 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, he admitted that our world is pervasively influenced by three ideologies, and that is the capitalism setup, the liberal democracy, which is liberalism. He calls it liberal democracy, but we know it's to be liberalism or, you know, communism. <laughs> yeah. But then the third one he adds is communism, all right? which I only see not too much of a difference. But anyways, even following from a secular historian standpoint, he admitted these are the three ideologies that influenced our whole world. And if you recall which religion was on all three of these movements, it's what religion? It's the Catholic Church. I've proven that, all right? They have a foothold in everything. Everything, everywhere, every ideology. When we come to Christianity as well, the Catholics have influenced Christianity as well, including the revised version set up. So I've proven that in our previous history class. The Catholics are everywhere. That's why I don't even have to mention the Catholics here because just take it for granted, they're everywhere here. So they got their, foots, uh, they got their foothold in everywhere, 
which is why there's some kind of an inkling of a Catholic, Catholic hints within our modern culture of the 20, 21st centuries. So you have to remember that. It's also a communist uh, ideology that spread throughout our world. There's no doubt about that. We've seen liberalism. They're trying to promote uh, more government control, more government control. And then we see the communists that's truly having a complete uh, dictatorship of a government control set up. Today's form is just a weakened form of communism, so to speak. But I don't see much of a difference. Basically, the idea is, is that if you have to have a government forcing you to do something, see that? If a government has more control or forces you to do something against your voluntary decisions, then that's where uh, I don't see much of a difference with communism. Anyway, it's a Catholic communist culture that we've got. But now we see right here revised dispensationalism. So this is important to understand. The IFB denomination, remember, is the only remaining denomination that's, uh, that the Lord raised up that fights against this entire modern culture, this entire apostasy. But the IFB culture has still been strongly brainwashed by the revised version setup. So they weren't King James only, even though they mainly use King James Bible, or even though they condemn modern Bible versions, they did not believe the King James Bible is perfect. So they didn't trust in it as final authority. So they didn't really trust in it as final authority. When you don't have that kind of belief, then the preaching of the Word of God is still weakened. It's not strong enough. Because they lost their authority, their doctrine is also getting infected. So revised dispensationalism came in. Now you notice right here, whenever something is revised, that should be something negative, right? So classical dispensationalism by Larkin, Schofield, and these guys was now being revised due to scholarship. It's always scholars that are to be blamed for everything in our world today. So then because Christians were... Uh, leaning more towards scholarship than toward the preaching of the Word of God, toward his revival movement. The scholars were infecting now doctrine, and dispensationalism is the number one doctrine that could have cleared up so much of apostasy or wrong doctrines. But now a revised form of dispensationalism is infecting. So notice that the IFB here, they're able to dodge the revised version but now they're infected by revised dispensationalism. So even if they have the uh, word of God, their doctrine is getting infected. Here, we got other IFBs who are infected by the revised version, as well as revised dispensationalism. So the point is, it's not enough to counter this kind of Catholic communism culture. Okay? The Catholic communism culture cannot be disintegrated unless you got one, you got the word of God in your hand that you can preach with full authority. And you base every belief on that book, a perfect Bible. That's enough to counter the beliefs of this culture. Because you need different beliefs based on the Bible. If it's perfect, then it's enough to counter it. The second thing is you need right doctrine. 90% of wrong doctrine in Christianity and even the world is based because of wrong beliefs of dispensationalism or no dispensationalism. So you need dispensationalism to clear all of that. Uh, here, here are just a few examples if people don't believe me. Uh, what's the common salvation that nearly everybody uh, agrees with, even major religions? Basically, as long as you're a good human being, then you should go to heaven. Unsaved people and I mean lost people or even atheists can agree with that one. Just be a good human being. Liberals like that. As long as you don't infringe upon my desires, my beliefs, as long as you tolerate it, you're a good human being, then you're a good human being no matter what religion you are. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, nearly all other religions, they agree good works for salvation. Christianity is also promoting good works for salvation now. If you're truly saved by faith alone, not by works, your works would show. See, that's still good works for salvation. 
So based on these three groups of people, which cover nearly all the world, see that? So this, we're talking about liberals or atheists or lost people in general. Second thing is religions around the world. And third thing is Christianity in general. See, they're all infected by that one wrong teaching. Dispensationalism, especially dispensational salvations, will clear it, basically proving that you're saved by faith, you're eternally secured by faith itself, even if good works don't manifest that well out of your life. Because other verses in the Bible that seem to teach about losing salvation or doing works for salvation are referring to a different dispensation, different time periods. Only Bible-believing, King James-only dispensationalism will teach that. But revised dispensationalism denies that. Okay, now, that was a mouthful of a whole summary. Let's break it apart with specifics now. If we have time uh, to go through everything, which I don't know if I will have time to go through everything, but I will do the best that I can. Okay. Now, first things first is let's go through our culture. If we go through our culture, then we will understand more. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now, remember, this kind of culture is Laodicea, correct? Laodicea apostasy. This is the time period we are now in. How did we end up here? We ended up here because I've already explained the history. We ended up here because we lost our authority on the word of God and right doctrine. Okay? So that's how we can end up in there. Revelation chapter 3. Hopefully the camera is aiming toward my direction now. It's switching all the time wherever I move. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Verse 14. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now there are several factors to consider here about Laodicea. How we ended up in this kind of a culture is because they lost, obviously, the authority, the preaching of the Word of God and wrong doctrine seeping in. So when you get those two problems, then what happens? What contributes to this culture? Three factors that the Bible pointed out in Revelation chapter 3. So, uh, let's see. I just click this one, and then it goes to the next page, or is it move? Hold it, and then move it? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. So there are three factors to consider about Laodicea apostasy that Revelation chapter 3 shows you. And I want you to mark it down. All right. These are the trademarks of Laodicea. And see if your Catholic communist culture or 20, 20th to 21st centuries in, is infected by this. Ready? One is, notice right here, prosperity. Prosperity is a, is a huge enemy. Ha, uh, Richard Warmbrandt, or Harlan Popov, either or, I think it was Richard Warmbrandt, who suffered persecution from communists, he said a greater threat to Christianity than the worst torture and persecution is prosperity. Because prosperity weakens our Christian resolve. Now notice that the 20th to 21st century, uh, when we reach this time period, it is a time... Oh, come on, dude. It is a time period of prosperity, right? Because of what I showed you in our previous history classes, World War I and World War II was what uh, you need catastrophe. Globalists need catastrophe to produce uh, more prosperity for their kingdom, remember? So catastrophes are important. After World War I, World War II, who came out the winners? Com uh, communist countries, or uh, the Russia and America. Those two came out the predominant winners. Europe, because they joined the winning side, America, they've conjoined to what is known as United Nations now. 
So we see two groups here is the communist side or rogue nations. Muslims are now joining that one versus United Nations. Those are the two main groups that we have to keep in mind when we hit toward the tribulation. But uh, besides the point, when we rewind over here, the point is that we've entered now an age of prosperity ever since from uh, probably 30s or 40s to 2000s or 290s, all right? It's safe to say probably better from 40s to 90s. 40s to 90s was our age of prosperity here. In our age of prosperity, that's why we became Laodicea. Why? When you have everything you want, you're not interested in the gospel. You're not interested in Bible-believing truth. You're not interested to get rid of your desires, your worldly Laodicea and fleshly desires, because you're in an age of prosperity that feeds your desires. So that's why the a Great Awakening Revival preaching didn't really have much of an effect, all right? Prosperity. The Bible says, I'm rich, increased with good, have need of nothing, right? All right, the second thing is, notice right here, a weakened form of Christ Christianity. It's not hot and it's not cold. It's a weakened form of Christianity. A weakened Christianity... Why? Because of the revised version, remember. So because of the revised version, and then also the wrong doctrines that are seeping in, it produced a culture that is like this. It's not enough to attack this culture, this kind of system in our world that's very pervasive. So a weakened Christianity will not destroy this. You need to strengthen a strong Christianity. But it's been weakened thanks to this idiot right here. This idiot, and then eventually this idiot. Okay? Now, the third thing, so it's a, an apostate Christianity is what contributes to Laodicea. That's how we ended up. If you, if you wonder how did we end up into this kind of culture, these are three main factors. Okay? Three main factors. And these three main factors happen because of the other two that we covered, you lost final authority and doctrines getting infected, okay? Now, the third thing, this is important, the meaning of Laodicea. Do you know what Laodicea means? It means rights of the people. So human rights. Now, look at the genius of the devil, okay? Think about this. Don't forget your history. Remember, America became a nation because of what we would think as rights of the people here. But then, in Laodicea, the Bible argues that rights of the people is what messed up our nation. So then, uh, what's going on here? I thought that what made America great was the rights of the people. Half truth and half lie. That's how the devil always works. They don't study their history. Who promoted equality, liberty, fraternity as well? and rights of the people. But it turned out to be the, one of the most chaotic setups ever in this messed up country, and they had a dictator after that. France. They boasted themselves age of enlightenment. Why? It was an atheistic setup without God. Because that was not in their minds, God was not in their minds. The Bible, the Word of God was not in their minds. They just promoted about equality for everybody, liberty, fraternity. But it became one of the most messed up eras. But not America. Why? It's rights of the people based on the Word of God. That's a huge, huge, absolutely huge difference. Why do you think American presidents still swear with the Bible on their hand? To rule over and to uh, lead the country. Because the Bible is so integral for the success of the nation. It cannot be denied. Even in court, you have to put your hand on the Bible. But then, now the authority of the Bible is attacked, and now they're using Catholic missiles or whatever to put your hand on, and then, God forbid, they're going to use a Quran or whatever. But the point is, the, they've been doing that, correct. But it's being more now... Man, God forbid it's going to hit the high, higher offices and more publicity getting out of that, right? But anyway, returning back to the main point, rights of the people, yes, based on the word of God. 
That's why Martin Luther, he was so pivotal where it started, uh, the, where it started the Catholic disintegration, the Catholic uh, communist setup during the Dark Ages, where the uh, Catholic Church ruled over all the world. Why? Because he said, I have the right to believe whatever I can according to my conscience. So see, based on morality. My conscience is bound, he says, to the text of the Bible. They forget that. You go to the statue, me and Rob saw it, all right, that when we, we go to Plymouth, where the pilgrims landed, they build up their statue, you know, where, uh, where the people built the statue celebrating their freedom, and it's all based on here is morality, education, and freedom, and all that, but it's surrounded by one bigger statue, and that's faith. Yeah, that's right. Oh, how about that? They don't t teach you that in schools. They've been throwing out faith ever since prayer was being kicked out of public Come schools. On. Ten Commandments and everything. So notice right here that the human rights is extremely dangerous. Not helpful for your nation. It's dangerous. Why? You go to the book of Judges. I'll show you. Hopefully camera's back on me, all right? Keep it on me, wherever I go. All right, let's go to the last chapter in Judges. You know what happens when everybody can get their rights, do whatever they want? It's chaos, like France, during the Age of Enlightenment. It doesn't become a, a really a democratic process. It becomes more of an oligarchy. Notice our nation currently is turning into that. So even though uh, lib liberal left-wing Democrats are still boasting about, you know, some forms of capitalism, they'll even admit that there are, there's an oligarchy set up within capitalism, and they themselves are the hypocrite. The, they themselves are turning into an oligarchy set up too. So see, it still doesn't change the fact that a group of globalists, see that, are still the one running the show. That's what you end up in. All right. Now, go to, uh, returning to the book of Judges, notice in verse 25, 21, Judges 21, 25. In those, day, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right, what? In his own eyes. Now, this is enlightening. This scripture is very eye-opening. Get ready for this, okay? What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. That includes the Bible. What men learn from the Bible, they don't learn from the Bible. Pay attention now. When you get this kind of a setup, trust me, it's not going to prosper. History proves that. It turns into chaos. What does this turn into when people cannot control themselves? What does it turn into? Use your head now. What does it turn into? Where's my pen? Okay. I'll just use a second pen here. All right. Oh, here you are. All right. What does this turn into? It turns into chaos. What does this demand then and turn into? It turns into, what does the Bible say in Judges? It's like the Holy Spirit predicted. The Bible says, in those days, there was what? No one ruler. For a bunch of people who were living chaotic in their own ways. You know what's going to happen? That's why it's, things are becoming more centralized. Do you understand? Because people don't behave themselves. Why don't people behave themselves? Because they don't have morality faith. If you have morality faith and people live freely according to the conscience, things become more sane. But when you don't have that, what does it turn into? Chaos. And when it turns into chaos, you want a king. Hey, it, it's, it's also guilty for conservatives. It was evident with uh, President Trump back then. He had to uh, call out the guard and everybody to forcibly, forcibly uh, quell opposition here. See, it demands that, no matter what. If you're a left-winger, right-winger, it don't matter. It don't matter. The Catholic Church was on both sides of that bird, both sides of that wing. We've seen that all the time. They just go whoever the winners are. 
but it always goes and it, it will eventually turn into one king. The nation of Israel, that's why their success or the, their, uh, their failure depended upon their king. When they had a king like David, that's why they were successful. But when they had a king that was against God, they fell. God knows that too. That's why God says in the end, when they go to their one king that keeps messing up, they're going to finally get their King David back. The Bible actually says that in the future. And they're going to get Jesus Christ, who will rule as the one king. That's when you will finally get everything right again. But without Jesus Christ, without a good king, without the right king, they're going to get the devil. And he will. That's why you got the Antichrist. So do you realize how close we are? This was, okay, let me show you how close. I don't know if you recognize how close we are, okay? Let me do this. Do you realize how close we are? I don't think you guys know. If you look at this time period right here, this was what? This was during 50s to 90s. Right? Rights of the people. Right? Economic prosperity, everything. Chaos has been 2010s to now. This is tribulation, one king. It's at that time period. Do you know where we're at? We're not even in here, guys. We're here. That's where you are at. Do you realize how close we are? Why are we here? Because it's getting more centralized. We even see from the conservative side how Trump had to take over everything forcibly to make sure things go the way that the conservatives want. And then the liberals have just retaliated in return with so many executive orders once Biden got into office. Why? Because Trump did the same thing too. See, it's always through executive decision. Has to be a leader who has to forcibly get things done to please some side there. See, we're here. Eventually, you're going to get over here, guys. That's how close we are. So think about rights of the people. Think about what is the number one time period you ever saw that really pushed this rights of the people garbage that it's not peaceful protest anymore. It's, are you paying attention? It's this. Have you seen that? Have you seen that? Two years ago, you've seen that, right? For one ethnic group that Europe has no relation to or other or other nations, they just butt into that. Isn't that weird? That's even none of their business, you know? It's funny, a bunch of black people, when they see those demonstrations going on two years ago, complaining at white people who are joining the group when they're not even of that nationality, black people complaining about white liberals, that's not us, that's not us. See, this is the idiotic world we live in, guys. That's an idiotic world we live in. So it's not rights of the people. See that? Yeah. No, it's people butting into other people's business, claiming my rights when they have no relation whatsoever. You want an example? People who are not even monkeys butt into monkeys' businesses and say, the monkeys have their rights. Trees who don't even say a word and idiots nailing themselves to trees and saying, don't kill the trees, they have their rights. See, it's not people getting, people having their own rights, it's not even their business. They just pry into other people's rights and say, my rights is their right. You know what that is? That's chaos. It's not this anymore, guys, okay? You have to understand this. We are not this, we are here. Every, everybody has a mental disease, okay? Look at the, I mean, it's so hilarious. You know, Wikipedia boasts about, you know, wow, unlike any other time period, there were more demonstrations and protests than ever before. That's not something to boast about, fool. I mean, if you look at those protests, it's this. It's chaos. 
which is why governments are forcibly putting their foot down. Do you realize that? This should be incredibly eye-opening, our history, to you. So this is where we're at now. Oh my goodness, I wasted 45 minutes. I didn't even read a single quote. Okay, I'm so sorry. All right. But, this should, uh, but I, I have to emphasize all this. That way you can understand where we're at. You have to understand where we're at. Okay, so now, oh, now we get to the specifics. I said that we would get into specifics, but not really. I was covering Laodicea. I was still in the summary. So now we're going to get to the specifics here. All right, let's talk about this kind of a world where we ended up in. First things first is uh, let's cover uh, the globalist right here on some specifics. So there's no doubt that there's globalists. If you look at um, uh, the list of the CFR members, it would uh, surprise you which kind of people are in that group and which kind of people who have been suspicious for certain catastrophic events that they're in this roster of Council on Foreign Relations. So uh, I will sh give you just a brief uh, inkling of that one if you're interested. Let's see here, just a brief inkling. Okay, um, let me move to this side. That way people can clearly see the names here. All right, so this is their membership roster right here. I'm going to just scroll through this. You, you'll probably see some interesting names here. This is all A, too, by the way, so I didn't even really go through everything. Man, this is a lot of names, so I won't be able to. So this is now B. But you'll see celebrities here. You're going to see uh, politicians. You're going to see uh, producers, directors. You're going to see CEOs, uh, tech uh, people related to tech aspects. I mean, all the big names are here, guy. And this is worldwide. But anyway, all you have to do, all right, let me rewind here. It's called, the title of the article is Membership Roster. Just look at Membership Roster and Council on Foreign Relations, okay? But Rick Warren is also in here, too, for some of you who didn't know that. So let me see if his name's here, but I saw it before. Oh, you saw it? Oh, yeah, he's right there. Okay, so see, Rick Warren's right here. Does this work? Yes, it works. Okay. See that? So Rick Warren's right there. Okay? So I told you so. So a lot of, you got to realize this. So notice that Christian apostates are joining globalists. You got no business doing that. You got no business doing that. Okay, so anyway... So just take a look at that one, and then you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. We're going to return to the whiteboard here. So that's the list of uh, big elites. So the roundtable succeeded now. Through the CFR, they have, uh, they have a predominant influence around our world. Now I'm going to read you two presidents, famous presidents of the United States. One is George Bush. And then we're going to look at Dr. Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God, starting on page 403, all right? All right, so y'all can see what's written here? All right, so I scrolled it uh, in, that way you can see more clearly. I'm going to move more to this side, that way you can read the whole text, okay? All right, here we go. This is what President Bush meant when he wrote, My senior year, I joined Skull and Bones, a secret society, so secret I can't say anymore. Skull and Bones? I thought that was ancient history during 1800s. All of a sudden, they come out again. Weird, huh? The only problem with that statement is that it was made by the leader of the <laughs> free world who also took an oath to uphold the United States Constitution. However, in a major conflict of interest, globalists like the Bush dynasty privately view the Constitution as a reproachful parchment to be circumvented at will. Grandpa Prescott, the honorable senator from Connecticut and the first Bush to lay in a coffin at Yale, 1917, found himself at the center of a major ba banking scandal in 1942. On October 20th of that year, the U.S. government order ordered the seizure of Nazi German financial operations. 
in New York City under the authority of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Uh, Robbins acknowledges Hitler's financier stowed $3 million in the Union Banking Corporation, a bank that counted among its seven directors, Prescott Bush. Uh, let's see here. In 1976 and 81, 85, GW's daddy was sworn in as director of the CIA. How about that? And as vice president by fellow Bonesman Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, who frequently attended Bush family barbecues. Then following his election to the highest office in the land, President Poppy declared in his first State of the Union address, which has become famous, what is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, a new world order can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into being, a world in which there is very real prospect of a new world order. So Dubia certainly knows where his bread is buttered. Robbins wrote, a Bush's initiation, a patriarch participant told me, all I will say about it is that he caught on pretty quickly, and I was pleased with his response. She also confirmed at least 58 bonesmen, skull and bones guys, four from Bush's 1948 club, six from George W. Bush's 1968 club, and seven from William F. Buckley's 1950 club, contributed at least $57,972 uh, to Bush's presidential bid, though many of them tried to circumvent campaign finance rules and donate more than the legal limit. Upon attaining the prize, the payoffs began. Robbins writes, also like his father, George W. Bush, has used his presidential power to reward his fellow bonesmen. One of the first social gatherings, possibly the first gathering, George W. held at the White House after his inauguration was a reunion <coughs> of his Skull and Bones clubmates. Some of his Bones cohorts would receive much more than a White House meeting. However, in November 2001, Bush appointed Edward McNally uh, general counsel of the new Federal Office of Homeland Security and a senior associate counsel to the president for national security. Frederick W. Smith, also a Bonesman, was reportedly George W.'s top choice for secretary of defense until he withdrew from the running because of a heart problem. One of President Bush's first appointments was 1968 Bones clubmate Robert D. McCallum Jr. to the $125,700 per year position of Assistant Attorney General. Civil Division, the largest litigation component in the Justice Department. The division represents the federal government in significant domestic and foreign policy cases such as fraud, international trade, patents, bankruptcies, and foreign litigation which can involve billions of dollars. His administration appointed Evan G. Galbraith, another bonesman, as the Secretary of Defense representative in Europe and as a defense advisor to the U.S. mission to NATO. About this time, the inevitable question arises, but isn't President Bush a born-again Christian, right? So then what's the statement on that one? So Grady goes on through the First Presbyterian Church, which is an apostate church, then he talks about the Billy Graham crusade. So that's a crucial one. That's why a lot of people think that George Bush is saved. But here's something that uh, is important for you to keep in mind, all right? So he gives several important things, but I'm going to give one statement here, which you can find with Obama's statement. So you can say that every president of the United States is saved, all right? He says, I would recommit my heart to Jesus Christ right here. That's what he said. And then he talked about God sent his son to die for a sinner like me. Now see, that sounds like a person who got saved. But remember this, presidents and politicians know what to say, what to say that would appease the Christian mindset. They know certain words on what to do. So politicians are not stupid, guys. You have to realize that. He never uh, pointed out right here that uh, as a repentant sinner, he put his trust only on what Jesus Christ did on the cross and to uh, deny good works for salvation because you'll notice right here it's not really denying good works for salvation right here. 
He said, I had always been a religious person, had regularly attended church. What if he didn't? You know why he's saying that? To try to appease people. Look, I've always been a, ba a good Baptist or a Christian. Just like Clinton, who was a Baptist. How about that? But here's a big thing right here. All right, here's a big thing. He says, uh, this is a reporter who asked Bush the following question. Mr. President, when you talk about peace in the Middle East, you've often said that freedom is granted by the Almighty. Some people who share your beliefs don't believe that Muslims worship the same Almighty. I wonder about your views on that. You know what Bush said? Brother Bush, the great standard bearer for the Church of Jesus Christ, <laughs> responded, I do say that freedom is the Almighty's gift to every person. I also condition it by saying freedom is not America's gift to the world. It's much greater than that, of course, and I believe we worship the same God. How about that? He said that. I believe, uh, he said, I believe we worship the same God about Muslims. Returning to our previous history lesson, you know why that religion was important? One, you needed uh, someone who would be a convenient target or group to use to fulfill uh, your bidding, right? For globalism. You need an enemy to blame, plus you need uh, somebody to join your side. And a lot of these, and this religion received no attention. And all of a sudden, we get a bunch of religious scholars from the fastest growing religion in the world joining hands with United Nations. So it's important that United Nations, that globalism agenda, it fulfilled their two roles. One, they have a group that they can put the blame on, that they could use to fulfill their bidding. The second thing is you also got the fastest growing religion, which should number a huge population, to join now their new world order system. So they now have to make people see that this is not a hateful or a dangerous religion. See, you have to keep that in mind. It fulfilled a double purpose for the globalists. Okay, so that's why Bush had to say that. Even though the one, he was the one who was doing a Christian war against a Muslim country and etc. No, no. His job was to introduce that religion to the world who received no attention before and to make sure that people now hold hands with this religion and have them conjoin wow. with the new world order system. Do you know how many Christians have joined hands with this religion now? Mm -hmm. I think Beth Moore was one of them. And then there are other preachers who are uh, condoning uh, and holding hands with this religion now. Even your beloved James White, the Calvinist. Yeah. Not, I'm not saying he's a Muslim, all right? But he's, he's treating them with more respect. And he's saying that that particular religion is not a dangerous religion. When you get a Calvinist scholar talking garbage like that, you know you're headed for the Antichrist religion. Yeah. All right, now, <clears throat> um, let's see right here. Uh, we'll skip that page. Now we come to Bill Clinton, page 459, 459. As a fitting conclusion to this chapter, can anyone deny the fact that an Arkansas hayseed by the name of William Jefferson Clinton was able to tap the awesome power of this Oxford nexus? After that ill-fated handshake with America's first Catholic president culminated in Clinton's education at Georgetown. Oh, Catholic place, right? Yeah. The liberal Southern Baptist set his sights for the lights. Do you happen to recall where the young profligate was when he didn't inhale? Can we say Oxford University? Now that was connected, you could guess, to which elitist group? The secret society group, Rhodes. Following two years of doping, fornicating, protesting, and studying as a Rhodes scholar, Clinton returned to the United States in 1970 to round off his internationalist training at Yale University's law school. Uh, you wonder if Skull and Bones was there too, because remember, they're connected to Yale. But anyway, there he met and lived with Hillary Rodham until their marriage in uh, 1975. Excuse me. From Yale, Bill went back to Arkansas, where he was 
promptly won election as attorney general and then governor. 1988, he was tapped for membership in the where? CFR. How about that? And only one year later, welcome into, whoa, David Rockefeller. Rockefellers now. Other Global Society, the Trilateral Commission. Then in 1991, he traveled to Baden-Baden, Germany to attend the secret annual meeting of the Bilderbergers, a one-world group formed by Rockefeller and Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Okay, so how about that? This glitton screams globalist, you can tell, all right? So many uh, names and red flags here. The following year, Bill Clinton became the 42nd president of this nation. For the record, CFR, the group Clinton, was able to prevail over CFR, the order Bush, because CFR Perot was sent in from the bench by the real powers that be. In fact, the following blurb was seen on the front page of the Wall Street Journal on May 29, 1992, only six months after the election. Friend in need, Perot's candidacy for the prestigious Council on Foreign Relations <coughs> several years ago was seconded by George Bush. A Perot aide says Bush's letter was lovely, but there aren't any plans to release the text. See that? So there's a real higher power that contributed to where you get your current presence, you have to keep in mind. There's a bigger power. The evidence was today. You think our current leader of the United States is really running the show? How about that? Although America's new commander-in-chief was denied the standard presidential national security clearance, being required to have a chaperone due to his rap sheet of weed smoking and draft dodging, like our current mayors and liberal politicians. But anyway, Bill was determined to have a good time and help a few of the boys up the old ladder in the process. With the Rhodes man in the White House, Dr. Cuddy exposes the philosophical nepotism that prevailed. Some of the Rhodes scholar appointed by President Clinton are all these names. See that? Just like Bush, just like uh, Bush. Notice that Wolsey's over there and then other big names. See that? See that? I don't have time to read it all, but I recommend reading Grady's book, page 459 and onward from his How Satan Turned America Against God. More names right there. He also mentions right here, there, these, uh, the ones in the list consist of road scholars and uh, trilateralists. Then he mentions over here, um, this is from John McManus, writes in The Insider, so I will read uh, that quote here. Character, patriotism, religious values, personal integrity, family loyalty, honesty, and virtually all else that Americans hope to find in a chief executive count for nothing with insiders. Those who know Mr. Clinton best know that he exhibits none of these important traits. Those who publish the only statewide newspaper in his home state, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, know it too. How about that? Their blistering editorial refusing to support him for president stated, it is not the compromises he has made that trouble so much as the unavoidable suspicion that he has no great principles to compromise. How about that from his own place? From his own place. So his compromising was not the issue. He had no great principles to begin with. That's the important thing to understand there. How about that, huh? By the time Monica Gate was ready to hit the fan, some of you know that scandal, 39 separate significant Clinton scandals had already been identified, a list that was eventually obtained by the House Oversight Committee. Two of the more disturbing exposés of the Clinton presidency are unlimited access by retired FBI agent Gary Aldrich assigned to the White House to perform background checks on White House personnel and dereliction of duty by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Buzz Patterson. Uh, blah, 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 blah. While the president is never to be separated from his Secret Service detachment, much less from the nuclear button, Aldrich confirms that Clinton frequently snuck out of the White House hiding under a blanket in the backseat of a sedan driven by longtime friend and staffer Bruce Lindsay to rendezvous with hookers at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Washington. Colonel Patterson's experience was even more unbelievable. After issuing Clinton his new set of nuclear go codes, now remember, we take nuclear warfare seriously, right? From our given history of the communists and us. Notice right here, 
Colonel Patterson and a military aide nearly went into shock when their commander-in-chief blurted out that he was unable to produce the old set. He wrote, one of the most important symbols of military power in the history of man had just exchanged hands. President Clinton looked up sheepishly and confessed, I don't have mine on me. I'll track it down, guys, and get it back to you. Just like our current one, right? Yeah. Left it at a garage in his home or in the back seat of his car. Look how irresponsible these people are. We immediately alerted, alerted the joint staff in the Pentagon. What do you mean? How could this happen? You've got to find it ASAP. They were incredulous. For days, we turned over everything in the White House. We talked to the ushers and valets and asked them to search the president's clothes and furniture in the residence. We asked the senior staff, specifically John Podesta and Bruce Lindsay, for help. The president finally threw up his hands and said casually, I just can't find it. Don't know where it is. As far as he was concerned, that was the end of the story. Now, you see that right here? This, this is why our country has weakened so much. Our country has weakened uh, that much. This is what we deserve. Remember that. This is what we deserve today. And uh, let me uh, conclude it uh, by pointing out the chart. That way you people can learn a valuable lesson here, all right? Don't ever forget the trademarks of Laodicea. Do you see yourself? following this pattern? It's not just a nation. It applies to the church too. When we get right here, because everyone has that selfish mentality, and then their hearts are not right with God, you get over here, and then you're going to get something like this if you're not careful. All right? So remember, this is a result because of a weakened Christianity. So check your Christianity. Check your prosperity, how much you're delving into that. And then beware of this. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Yep. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching has been sobering, eye-opening to us. May we learn our lessons and never forget, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.